Hello, Embers, and welcome back to the Ember Exchange. I'm Dylan. And I'm Jill. And I'm Heidi. Thanks, guys, for being here, and thank you for listening. We're really excited to have yet another episode. Uh, it's shaping up to be a bit of a spicy one. Yeah, we're really going like full send on this yeah. one. <laughs> so the topic today is going to be DEI, or diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and so this often can get pretty intense in discussions, certainly in social media yeah. and online, um, but we want to keep this constructive and respectful here and and really what the Ember Exchange is about, which is stoking conversation, sharing ideas, and trying to get at what Christ wants us to think about these things. And so that's going to be our goal here. And if that sounds interesting to you, you've come to the right place. Yeah. So uh, the other thing that we're going to do, because this is a big topic, you've maybe noticed a little bit of a trend in recent episodes that we've been doing kind of one topic instead of the double topic that we started off with. This is going to be another single topic episode just because it's so big. We might not even get through all of it in this episode. Um, so hang tight. At the very least, I'm sure we'll cover these topics again. But mm -hmm. because uh, I know the Embers are very excited about Mortal Spirits, our newly named tasting segment. Um, we're going to we're gonna cut the discussion in half with some mortal spirits. And yes, I finally have brought some whiskey back. By popular demand, there will be some whiskey. So Popular demand by the embers. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Not by the hosts necessarily. So we'll do that uh, about halfway through. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Without further ado, let's stoke some conversation. All right. So uh, it's the end of February by the time that people are listening to this. It's not the end of February when we're recording this, but we looked at the calendar and we're like, boy, it's going to be the end of February. We just made it through Black History Month. And so this topic, of course, uh, as I said in the intro, is DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion. That shows up in a lot of places. I think a lot of people think about that in terms of hiring, mostly. Mm -hmm. um, but it shows up in college admissions or scholarships or, you know, basically any time you have people being selected for anything. Um, so just to, to headline this right off the top, I'll give kind of a definition. I don't know that this is my favorite definition, but this seems to be at least a reasonably broad and agreed upon definition across a lot of different sources. And then we'll go into why maybe I'm not as much of a fan of it. But just to, to top it off, the definition of DEI is a concept that aims to create a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive society or organization by promoting the presence, participation, and success of individuals from various backgrounds and experiences. It encompasses efforts to address historical and systemic inequalities, foster creativity and innovation, and ensure a sense of belonging and equal opportunity for all. Mm -hmm. So before we dive completely into, you know, all of the details there, I thought it'd be interesting to have just a little bit of a background on the reason that we picked the topic, which is Black mm -hmm. History Month. So Jill, our resident historian, has some facts for us about Black History Month. I do. So the idea was really to promote the study and appreciation of African American history. And it didn't used to be a month. It used to be a week. Started in 1926. That's older than I thought it was. Or that's older than I would have expected that it would have been. Right? Because you think civil rights movement. Yeah, yeah. That's like right. Much later than that. But okay. Interesting. Yeah. So in 1926, yeah. a historian, Carter G. Woodson, chose February for this celebration because it actually coincides with Abraham Lincoln's birthday, February 12, mm. and Frederick Douglass's birthday, February 14. Oh, okay. Both cool. pretty important figures who had a significant impact on the lives of African Americans. So with that kind of as the, the context, right, coming off of that, I imagine that the Embers have probably heard a lot about things related to DEI in the last month. So probably mm -hmm. I would like to start off with kind of the definition. So based on what I read that so it's a pretty nice sounding like pull off a website yeah. advertisement sort of thing for it. But it it doesn't really get into the details of exactly what it is or what its implications are. And I think in a lot of cases there are nice sounding terms that are used to obscure or imply a lot more than the face value of the words indicates. 
the easiest example I can think of this is Black Lives Matter. On its mm-hmm. face, the words Black Lives Matter is not something that anybody would disagree with. Of course, it's true. they matter, right? Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean the face value of the words, obviously. There's so much more to that and things that are associated with it that it's very hard to affirm a statement like that when you know the context. And so mm-hmm. in the same way, diversity, equity, and inclusion sounds very nice, but there's a lot underlying that. I feel so. like it just causes like cognitive dissonance. Yes. When you're like, okay, black lives do matter. I don't disagree with that statement, but I disagree with the organization. And you have to like yes. dive deeper into it to have real like solid thoughts on it instead of just black lives matter. It's a hook. Mm-hmm. And it's particularly frustrating because if you say, well, no, I don't agree with that then somebody will, you, you don't think black lives matter. Right. And so it's this bait and switch that's really frustrating <laughs> uh-huh. um, and disingenuous, right? It's not intended to foster good conversation. It's intended to try to trip you up and, and yeah, cause confusion. Right. So maybe my, my starting question for you two is when you hear DEI or diversity, equity, inclusion, what does that bring to mind to you? Does it bring to mind this sort of vanilla definition that we read or are there additional things that come with that in your minds? I think of my previous place of work and we always every year had like a DEI day and we would have someone come in and do a full day like seminar on diversity, equity and inclusion and how that's a part of the organization and how to operate within that as an employee of the organization. So I actually enjoyed some parts of it and then there were other parts that really bothered me. So I think there is a time and a place for DEI, but I think the way that society has um, curbed it really is disappointing. Okay. I would say the first thing that comes to mind for me, or maybe the first two, first one being reverse discrimination okay. is mm-hmm. my sort of immediate thought. Second one being, man, DEI has done a good job of building its industry. I think Black Lives Matter, DEI, all kind of fit under this industry that they've created for themselves in which the greater people and corporations are the consumers of. So it sounds like you think of it more on like a political front, whereas I think of it more as I think the purpose of DEI initially was to ensure that there is diversity within workplaces. I think it likely came from a good place and then quickly got twisted. Who did it come from in the first place? That is a great question. So do you think that those people that it came from had an ulterior motive? Potential? Well, because... I don't know. From my understanding, I would say... Yes, DEI is at face value. The words mean nice things that mm-hmm. we all agree with. To an extent. I actually yeah. have a huge problem with the word equity, but we can go into that. To an extent. Sure. To an extent. However, it wasn't, last I checked, at any of the jobs that I've held since this has become more of a thing. I have never found that DEI comes from the ground up from employees that are working in a company that say, hey, I think that this would be really cool to start this. It comes from a much more top-down thing. There seems to be some grants and different money behind it to encourage employers to participate. And you have to, you know, prove you have a DEI committee and there's so many people on it, etc. And to me, that feels, what Dylan said earlier, very disingenuous Mm -hmm. and also not coming from the right place. So what would be the right place? So I hear Heidi asserting that diversity is a good thing. And I think there's a lot of people that agree with you. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't necessarily agree with you. Okay. And well, okay, sorry. I'm going to back up a second. I asked you to both give your understanding of what is behind the the nice sounding definition of DEI. Yeah. I should answer that question myself, probably. I think that it's more in line with what Jill was saying. It is not just more political, it is 100% political. And I think it is an attempt to condition 
individuals in the world and in our country, but everywhere. It's not just a United States thing. To put secondary characteristics as the most important and defining thing about a person uh, and, and use that then as in place of merit. Okay, so Mm -hmm. I will show my hand right off the bat. I think meritocracy is the standard to which we should be applying many, many, many things. And that doesn't just apply to, you know, being more diverse and equitable and inclusive. That means that maybe we shouldn't have 80-year-old people in the White House because that doesn't seem to me like they are winning on their merits, right? Maybe we should have somebody who is able to not fall up a flight of stairs or something. But right. right, you you should have a job because you are the most qualified person for it. And that's the only requirement. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what you believe. If you are the most qualified person for a job, then you should get the job. Mm-hmm. And so DEI, in my understanding, is a way to undercut that. Um, and I would like to highlight too that I think – Probably in our discussion, there's going to be a lot of things surrounding race here, but DEI is more than just that, right? It's race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, and disability. And if you've listened to some previous episodes of this, you know kind of where we stand on some of those things. Um, so yeah, it's more than just race. There, I hate the word intersectional because um, that's a, a, another one of those DEI words, but yeah. to use a terrible word that I hate, it's a very intersectional topic because it combines a lot of these things that are challenging and and we would say are, are ways that people are trying to influence us to think in not Christ-like ways. So that's kind of my perspective on it. So with all that in mind, I heard you say, Heidi, that you think of diversity as a very important and beneficial thing. Mm-hmm. I don't know that that's necessarily the case. Um, and it sounds nice, right? We agree that the headliner words sound nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I need to be convinced. So why is diversity important? I think diversity is important. Um, first of all, I don't know that diversity of race, sexuality, gender. Well, actually, I do think gender is important. But um, these like outward things that really have nothing to do with your experience or your thought process – I don't know that that's as important as um, having a table of people who like think differently so that we can come to the best conclusion. If everyone's on the same track, then things might get done faster, but they might and be more efficient, but they might not be the most advantageous for everyone in the organization. So I think there needs to be representation of people in the organization at the leader table. So when it's all just white men who think the exact same, that might not be the best decision. We need to have like women and other people in the room in order to like voice their opinions and where people are coming from. So I, I hear you saying that diversity of opinion yes. is important. Yes. So often what happens is to take that a step further, people say, well, you, Heidi, are a white woman, so you don't have the opinion or perspective, the lived experience. <laughs> Every experience is lived such a dumb unless you're dumb dead press. and then you don't have any more <laughs> so experiences <laughs> you don't have the lived experience of a transgender black woman so why would you say that that doesn't get to be on the the leadership committee right and that's the thing you can just take it down these rabbit holes that eventually become very evil and contrived so fast but i think that the idea of having a diverse table of leaders or a diverse people in your workplace with different thoughts and opinions, I guess that will naturally happen because everyone has different thoughts and opinions. But like, I think that is important for us as human beings to learn how to like get along with people and to learn from each other. There is more creativity that happens when you're able to see another human being for a human being who you can love and respect And we can come together to make a better decision than I would on my own. We're built for community. Therefore, we're built for diversity. And I don't think the goal should be to, like, negate diversity. So meritocracy does not intend to negate diversity. If diversity happens as a result, it's it's neither here nor there. Like, you're not excluded because you're a woman. Mm -hmm. You're not excluded because you're a black person. But you're not included simply because you are those things. And so what happens with DEI then is that 
it's not, it sounds like what you're describing is you would still want the most qualified people in the room. Yeah. But I also want them to like look and think different. So if the, there's a person who is more qualified, but happens to be a white guy sitting next to a less qualified black woman, you would choose her over the white dude, even though she's less qualified. I think that you can find a hundred thousand of the most qualified people and many of them will be white men, but some of them will also be people who are not white men and who are black and women and come from different perspectives. And lesbian and trans. Sure, if they're the most qualified. That doesn't happen, though. You don't get a pool of 100,000 applicants. You get 10 people who apply. Right. And so if the black woman is the most qualified person, then by all means, she should be the one that gets hired. Mm -hmm. If she's not the most qualified... Then she likely shouldn't be hired. Okay, so we we agree. We do agree, but also I think that it's not a bad thing to recognize that if you have a pool of, let's say, 10 applicants and they're all white men, maybe instead of just automatically hiring, let's say you're hiring three people out of those 10, instead of just hiring three white men because that's all you have, broaden your search a little bit to find someone who thinks differently or looks differently to put on your team who's just as qualified as the white man. Can so Jill, I, yeah, tell me I, about your experience with that. Well, could I put a few numbers behind this idea that you're saying? So yeah. we'll stick to a pool of 10. Okay. Okay. So in I'm going to use some numbers just based off of like the – Bureau of Labor, most of them were from 2021 and 2022. Mm -hmm. One of them being the United States population, being 333,449,281 people. 57.8% of them being white, so almost 60%. Right. 18% being Hispanic or Latino, but they actually categorize that as an ethnicity and not a race. 18% being listing themselves as other, because again, these numbers, right, they are self-identified. So we are working with that there. 12% being black, two or more at 10%, 5.9% being Asian, and then native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander is 0.2%. So in a room of 10 applicants, if you were going to get exactly the same numbers that you get based on our population, that would mean six of them would be white. Maybe two, maybe not quite two, Hispanic, maybe around two of them being other, and one of them being black. Now, based on merit alone, just by the odds, you have a 60% chance, right, mm -hmm. of having a white person. 100%. So, so I agree with that, that if you're in a room with 100% black people, that is not DEI. That is a room full of black people, which is statistically like unlikely in your average American organization. And so that means likely. Unless you're a basketball team. Unless you're a basketball team, which even. Which, funny enough, which in they the aren't NBA, required to match the quotas. Yeah, which in the NBA, 74.2 of those in 2021 were listed on rosters as black. 18% being white rude okay <laughs> yeah so. and no and, that's fine though right similarly on merits they are better at basketball so they should be the ones on the team so that's great and similarly yeah, but... in the nfl 57.5 percent of the rostered players black yeah 28 percent being white and nobody's complaining about that no no in fact, also, some of the highest paid people, so then if you go into the stretches mm. of DEI saying that there's this huge gap in pay, well, some of the highest paid Americans in this country are on that list of 57% in the NFL and 74% in the NBA, and arguably some players are paid more and less in there, but when your percentage is higher that they literally just exist on those teams, then... Yes, some of them are getting paid the most money in the United States and also, like, the world. Yeah. Some of the wealthiest people. Interesting. So the second component is equity. And as I said earlier, I have a big problem with this word. But before I tell you guys why I don't like using that word in there, I would be interested. Um, maybe do you want to hit us with a definition really quick of what equity means? Yeah, I can teach you with the definition. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... Again, going back to the very nice textbook definition of equity, it would be 
ensuring fairness and justice for all individuals, particularly members of underrepresented or marginalized groups. It involves providing equal opportunities and resources to individuals from different backgrounds in order to level the playing field and address historical and systemic inequalities. These definitions drive me crazy because the first sentence is something I can always get behind. Like, okay, ensuring fairness and justice for all individuals. That is something that's great. And then you go to the second sentence. It's not even the second sentence. It's the second half of the first sentence. Okay, but we can... Okay. Particularly members of underrepresented or marginalized groups. But then you're you're literally contradicting your first half of the sentence by saying ensuring fairness and justice... For all individuals, if you are particularly picking out a group, now you have now shifted them above the rest of the people. No, because they started below. No, because we're saying we're trying to ensure fairness and justice for all individuals, right. period. Right, so if, if like, okay, so if everyone else is here and you have someone here and you're trying to make it fair, you have to uplift them above everyone no, no. else if to make No, no, if you are saying equal. the bar is fairness and justice for all people and everyone should just be right here. Yeah. And then you're saying, but particularly we need to bring up unrepresented marginalized groups. No, you are shifting one above the other. You are trying to take them and say, we are going to pay more attention to these people to get them there. Okay. So this is exactly why I don't like the word equity. This, this dispute right here. So equity and equality are not the same thing. Correct. Equality means everyone has the same shot. And in America, everyone has the same shot. Since the Civil Rights Act, everyone has had an equal shot. Everyone starts in a different place. Everyone starts in a different place. Yep. And that's just how life works. So what you make of yourself is entirely your own responsibility. Okay? It is more difficult for person A, who is who might be black, not have a father in the household, grow up in poverty... And have minimal opportunities, but they still hypothetically have the same shot. Minimum opportunities, that guy or gal can go and start by working at McDonald's during their high school years just as much as the next kid. And then work themselves up, get an education, and apply for the same jobs that everybody else can apply for. Granted, they're not a criminal, but okay, yes. You're exactly right. So everyone has, everyone starts at a different point. I wasn't born with a billion dollar trust fund. And so I had to work hard and apply myself to get to where I'm at. Did I have to work as hard as some kid who grew up in a trailer park? No, but that's how life works. Everybody starts a different point And what you make of yourself is your responsibility. Which I agree with completely. But why does assisting the person who starts lower mean that they I mean, yeah, they might not work, have to work as hard if they started here, but you're not just by giving them money going to jump them up here. You actually have to put some effort and, like, apply yourself, right? So why does, like, me giving them some government some uh, government assistance or, like, a job to kick their, start their career that brings them to, like, maybe the middle and then they can take a smaller leap? That's like, not, why is that so bad? Because that's not what DEI do, is doing. So right. I have two questions. Okay. First off. D- yeah, go ahead. Yeah. First question is, so you are giving this person who is less qualified a job instead of. So I'm not saying a leadership position. I'm no, 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 saying like an any internship. Job, just any job. Yeah. You're giving that. There's a, there are a finite number of jobs. Mm-hmm. You're giving that job to somebody who is less qualified instead of. Someone who can go and who more easily qualified. get a job. It doesn't across work the that street. way, though, because the job across the street has the same exact DEI policies as you do. So, uh, yeah, this is irritating because it's like policies I don't agree with. The heart behind it, I agree with. Okay. <laughs> because it's like, yes, I want to give this kid a shot who like might not otherwise have that, the opportunity. Though. You don't agree with the heart behind it because the heart behind it is the political push of it. And that is what DEI exists today. You agree with the heart shedding a Christian light on it. Yeah. And I agree with ensuring fairness and justice for all individuals. Which everyone has. In the United States, everyone has the same opportunity and the same potential, right? That's, that is what the reason that we had 
illegal immigration is a whole thing. That's not today's topic. We had a ton of legal immigration in the 1900s, mm -hmm. just loads and loads and loads of it because America is the land of opportunity. You can be a poor Irish potato farmer who has next to nothing and you show up here and you apply yourself and you work hard and you can become a respectable middle class individual. Like that's how America works. It's designed for you if you put in the work, you can make something of yourself. It's 100% true. The, the trouble with these sorts of policies and, and programs is that it says, Heidi, I get that you worked really hard. Um, but just because you don't look like that person over there, I'm not going to give you the same opportunity. So it, it undercuts the idea of equality, which is the point. So I, I still haven't told you guys why I don't like the word equity. Okay. Um, equality means everyone gets the same shot. Equity doesn't mean that everyone gets the same shot. It means that everyone has to end up in the same place. Okay. And so what that means is doesn't matter how much effort you put in, doesn't matter where you mm -hmm. start, you will end up in the same place as somebody else. And so the spirit behind that, the, the positive spin on that is, yeah, if you start more disadvantaged, you will end up in the same spot as somebody who didn't. That also means that if you apply yourself and you work really hard and you try to pay off your student loans and get a job in high school and, and do whatever to optimize for yourself and somebody else says, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to flunk out of high school and then sit around on my hands for the rest of my life. They also should get in the same ending place as you. Mm -hmm. That's not fair. That's ridiculous. Right. And that's exactly the sort of behavior that DEI policies encourage. So you also were saying, right, like, oh, we want to bring up the underrepresented. However, in a lot of those situations, the person that put in all of the work and the effort, not only are we uplifting someone that hasn't done that with their life, even though they've had the chance to, just like everyone else, it also usually means that someone's got to be dragged down. They don't just get, everyone doesn't just get elevated to this high level, right? Someone is getting dragged down <laughs> to the lower level due to it as well. The other question I was at would ask is why, and maybe you wouldn't agree with this, do you think that everyone should end up in the same spot? Do you think everybody's entitled to end up in the same spot? Because I don't. I think in the world that we live in, I agree that if everyone is at the same spot, then no, no one's gaining anything. Like we need the wealthy really badly to provide jobs and income for the people who are not as wealthy. Because if we're all at the same level, then everyone's poor. And there is no yes. assisting anyone. So... Uh, no, I don't. It's, I don't think that everyone should be at the same playing field. You think everyone deserves to end up at the same spot? No, I don't think that everyone inherently deserves one thing or another. But I do think that it it wouldn't be so bad for someone who had the opportunity to start way up high to look at the person who didn't have that same opportunity and offer them an quote unquote easier shot or a shot that might advance them up faster than if they did it on their own. I kind of think this whole idea of put your bootstraps on or strap your bootstraps on and do it yourself. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Yeah. I think that's a very individualistic way to look at life. And so we need to be able to look at our fellow individuals and community members and say, how can I help you? Because I can either continue to rise up this ladder myself or I can like grab other people below and help pull them up as I'm also gaining momentum. Like, so I don't think there's anything wrong with putting policies in place that encourage this assistance of people. I think that's exactly what Jesus did. And later we can talk about this whole fairness and how we're not supposed to be at the same level because we live in a sinful world. We really are all at the same level, whether we like it or not, at the foot of the cross. So, like, I don't... I think that sometimes all of this can get really 
political, which it is, right? It's spinned in that way. But when you just take away the politics of it, it's like this is actually a really good thing to be looking out at our people through sort of a DEI framework as individuals in how we live our lives, not necessarily as a framework for an organization to hire people, if that makes sense. You made a little bit of a switch there. I, you went from the idea of individually as somebody who has been given much, it is a good thing for me to look for those who need assistance and help them mm -hmm. to saying, and so therefore we should put policies in place to do that. To encourage And anytime you say policy, that. that means government. And having the government, that's not in the realm of government. I hate living in a sinful world. <laughs> I do. Can I ask you an additional follow-up question to that? Yeah. If you were disadvantaged, didn't have a job right now, didn't know, you know, came from a broken home, all of the things that we would say, okay, that makes you underrepresented and kind of lands in the, right in this DEI wheelhouse. Mm. And someone said to you, Heidi, you don't have to do anything, but I'm going to give you this job. And the guy next to you said, I'm going to help you work hard and get to the point where you can get this job and raise up a family for your own and buy your own house. Which option would you take? Well, for sure, the second one, but it also depends on... The second one? Well, you the would, one You'd want to work hard and put in the sweat and blood and tears. Well, yeah, to, to well, get a leadership. A that's because you are... Yeah. yeah, but here's the thing, and it depends on what kind of job we're talking about and who, who we're talking about here. If you're talking about a 15-year-old kid who wants a job at McDonald's, I mean, like... Well, I'm not. I'm talking about those that are going to make good money flying your plane and right for risk, sure. Like or then, a justice of the Supreme Court or yeah. the vice president of uh, the United States. If, right. if I can give you a job tomorrow that's going to pay you a hundred thousand dollars and it's just yours because you're black, or I will teach you over the next five to ten years how to make your own way and get that hundred thousand dollar paying job. Which one do you think people are going to take most of the time? Pro well, I mean, yeah, people are lazy. So the first one. Okay, so the first one. So then what DEI generates is just this, like, victimhood mentality. A, like, if, if I'm on the wrong side of things, then I can get something for free. So why wouldn't you always want to be on the side of getting the thing for free? And people do I'm, they like intentionally if, invent yeah. victims. Yeah, so can this I, is if I can, yeah, really can I be can I be on this side where I have to work hard for the thing, or if I do this victimhood thing, I'll just get it for free. Which one would you pick every single time? Not Heidi. Which one gets Sorry. picked every what, single time? What one gets picked every single time? Right? Many times. Just, there are a lot of really good people who don't do that. But you're encouraging for people to just look for special treatment and privilege, right? Right. Instead of putting in the work or even if they, like I said, even if they were offered the opportunity of no matter, like at the end, the result is the same. You're going to get this nice paying job and nice house and all the things. One of them you can have right now for free without doing anything except the way you look by checking the box or. See, this is why these things are like ridiculous. Like, this shouldn't even be a conversation because, like, it shouldn't, it, like, in no way, shape, or form should high-paying, important jobs that have people's lives at stake or, like, decisions to be made be made by DEI. Like, that is ridiculous. Amen, Correct. sister. But when we're looking at jobs like McDonald's or, like, helping someone, giving them a shot at life, like, yeah, we can look at DEI and see how we can encourage people who are diverse and there's ec increase their equity so increasing the fairness of the, like the starting point that's great does I, that make sense i fundamentally disagree i think that at any level if you are favoring someone based on a immutable char characteristic that is wrong <sighs> yeah. because everyone in america has the ability to work hard and make something of themselves 
Does everyone have the ability to be Elon Musk multi-billionaire? No. No, but not everyone should. No. And so everyone has the ability to go and find a burger flipping job. Everyone. Do you know how much they pay at like Dude, Burger King these stupid. days? stupid. It's ridiculous. Okay? <laughs> I... You just have to show up, look halfway decent, and be polite to customers. It's it, not even not that hard. Not even. <laughs> Two out of three of those, and you can still get the job. Right. And and your local gas station will pay you seventeen dollars an hour to stand there and say, "Have a good morning with your donut." Okay, but this actually, thing. this this is deeper, and I I agree with everything. It's just my heart, you know. Yes. So here's the thing: it is so irritating sometimes when I drive by this billboard that advertises like Amazon's paying twenty eight dollars an hour. Which is like as much or more than I'm making as a college graduate who like worked hard to get through college and like did all the things and I could have walked into Amazon and made more money. That's a different conversation about how college yeah. is a scam. And hard I say that as somebody who has a PhD, okay? But, but now think about that in the sense of you go and you applied for the job that you just got and you worked hard to get it and they say, oh, sorry, Heidi, you're not black, so we're not going to hire you. Yeah, that's yeah. how does that make you feel? So all of that. Uh, there's one more. There's one more aspect to DEI. So we've talked mm -hmm. again. This is very high level, folks. We could spend an entire hour talking on each one of these. Um, but to for the interest of giving kind of an overview perspective, we're definitely going to come back to this at some point. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to the third component here, which is inclusion. Um, and of the three, this is the one that I think it just has so much baggage. Right, because you think inclusion, like including people, is a good thing, right? That's what we always, when, you know, the, the kid on the playground. If he's over by himself, he's you should sad. go include him. He's sad, but what inclusion really means is that means that I, as a transgender cat man, should be allowed to teach your kindergartners. That's inclusion, and put pride flags all over my classroom, and ask your kids to describe their most, I'm not going to, you know what, I want to keep our clean rating on this. So I'm not going to describe some of the literal assignments that have come out of these classrooms. That's inclusion. And that's not okay. Or the classroom that allowed the children then to actually follow up on some of the things that maybe they are engaging in because they see adults doing the same thing. And so therefore... There's a kitty litter box in the classroom now for kids to go in because Which they identify as cats. And there are you can find articles that are like that's not actually happening. It's actually happening. It's actually it's happening. For real. And that is because well those kids also need to feel included. No. I, no. You do not get to include your <laughs> litter box. Okay. I'm sorry. No. I'm gonna laugh because it's, it's ridiculous. It's it is ridiculous. absurd on its face. Or, and what? not even going that far. But there are legitimate classrooms that sound more like going to the petting zoo because Bobby decides he's a dog today, and you have to call him by dog dog self pronouns. Yes. So right. you have to call him. You have to call him Rover, and then. But you can't tell his parents that at school yeah, he goes but, by the name Rover. But Jenny over here feels like a cat. And so when asked a question, you have to be like, Rover, can you tell me what two plus two is? And instead, he just barks. And that's okay. And that's, that's an, an acceptable a. answer because you have to include him in the classroom. So how often is this happening is my question. If it's happening at all, that's too much. Right. One is too many. No, I agree with the fact that it should never happen. But like when it does happen, can't we just address that individually and say this is not a part of DEI? Like, but this... that doesn't happen though because the teacher encourages that. You look at the teacher and they're a transgender cat man. Then first of all, I'm homeschooling my child. Yes. Second of all, why can't we just have common sense? Where it's You like... ask too much, Heidi. <laughs> It's like, okay, we create opportunities for people so that we can have some diversity of thought. We can encourage. That's not, that's not thought I want to have, though. 
I don't want the thoughts of the transgender cat man. I'm not interested in what he thinks. Right. So we don't have to take the most far-fetched thoughts and include them in the diverse but, thoughts. I'm just saying, but, like, normal people coming together with different perspectives. So, let's so where do you read... draw the line? So, and how oh, do you draw sorry. the line? You were saying let's not include those thoughts. First of all, we have to draw a line for that. But let's read the definition of what how they define inclusion in DEI to see if we are allowed to eliminate these maybe too far for you thoughts that you're saying. Well, yeah, because they're, they're well. Just... The definition is ridiculous. The definition is the practice of creating environments and culture that are welcoming, supportive, and accessible to all individuals, regardless of their background, identity, or abilities. It involves making sure that everyone feels valued, respected, and heard, even if it's a bark, and that their contributions are recognized <laughs> and appreciated. Did you see any room in that definition to exclude the barking? I'm sorry. It would have been a transgender meowing cat man. Everyone and all individuals but why need do to we... be valued, respected, and heard. Why do we have woof, to go? Woof, <laughs> woof. Do you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> why do we have to go so far? Like Because that's, that's the natural extent, right? Is uh, that the we, natural extent? We <laughs> live not the natural we extent. We live in a sin cursed world. And yes. So as soon as you start entertaining the idea that you can be whatever you want. No. No, you can't. And and this is where I it goes back to a little bit of why I don't even think diversity is necessarily always a positive thing. Because when you have a common identity mm -hmm. and a common goal you achieve far more than if you have a whole bunch of people who have different ideas of what the thing should be. And they're bringing their own individual perspectives and their own uh, disparate goals that are not necessarily in the interest of the whole. It's oftentimes what is best for me. And that's probably in conflict with what's best for you and for the group. Whereas if there's cohesiveness, that results in better outcomes, better results for the group as a whole. And there's studies that show that. Yeah. Were there any other thoughts on inclusion before we go to break? No. Okay. I think that's a good overview. I feel like we, we really hammered in on the transgender cat man in inclusion um, because he deserves it. Yeah. And like that, but those examples, those outlier examples. They're not that outlier. Right. And that's the issue is that we didn't squish the outliers. We're encouraging the outliers to come in and make that the norm, which is why it makes it hard for someone who's like, yes, inclusion is good to say, yes, inclusion is good because we know that that means automatically you have to let in the transgender cat man. Yeah. yeah. Which ruins it for everybody else. You betcha. Yes. That's ridiculous yeah well on on that note um let's let's go ahead and take a deep breath we've uh efficiently or not we've covered diversity equity and inclusion together and individually um so we'll take a break for some mortal spirits here uh, and then we'll come back and have a little bit more free form i had some uh, additional probing questions and i'm sure that you guys have some additional thoughts just in general on this again this is not an exhaustive discussion. We could talk about this for a lot of episodes, and I think we will come back to it in the future. Um, but yeah, just trying to get an overview. But I could use a drink. I don't know about y'all. <laughs> so, Some water. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> Okay, so Mortal Spirits is back. This is, we've tasted a lot of things, but this is only the second time that we've called it Mortal Spirits. The other thing that's back is whiskey. And I heard at least one person 
if if you told me this, you know who you are, who was like, oh, when are you guys going to start tasting whiskey again? Well, the answer is today. So today we have, it is from Dancing Goat Distillery, which is a Wisconsin distillery, Mm -hmm. which is cool. And this is an eight-year-old American corn whiskey. And it is it is labeled Stillman's Private Stock. So the way Dancing Goat works is they they do limousine rye, which is like a, a big famous one that everyone knows about. But a lot of their Dancing Goat branded stuff is barrel pick only. Liquor stores will get set samples from distilleries of certain barrels. And so when it's a single barrel or it's a blend of things... Um, usually for single barrel, then the owner of the liquor store gets to taste the ones and say, I want this barrel. Mm-hmm. And then so you can only get that barrel at that given store and then all of your barrels taste slightly different. Um, so it can be kind of a fun way. So you could get, you know, three different bottles of the Dancing Goat eight-year uh, American corn whiskey from three different liquor stores. They'd be from different barrels that might taste different. Uh, yeah, okay. So that's what the Stillman's private stock means. Mm-hmm. It is an American corn whiskey, which is not a bourbon. So... Uh, brief quiz time. Do you remember what makes something a bourbon based on the last time that we had this? I know it's been a while. It's been a few episodes, but do you remember? It has to do with the mash bill was what I originally told you guys. I don't remember. You don't remember? No, okay. I don't remember. So I was contrasting it initially with uh, rye, right? So there was, if you wanted it to be bourbon, it had to be 51% or more corn in its mash bill. Rye has to be 51% or more rye. Corn and rye. So when I say that this is a corn whiskey, not a bourbon, it didn't happen for you guys, but maybe some of the embers were like, huh, I wonder why this isn't a bourbon if the mash bill is predominantly corn. That would fill the requirement that he described when we were talking about bourbon. Okay. And it turns out that the mash bill is not the only thing that defines something as a bourbon. There's a couple of other things. Okay. So one of the requirements is the age. A bourbon must be aged at least two years. So this one's an eight year, so meets that requirement. So again, still think, still seems like it should be a bourbon. Mm-hmm. The last one is the one that's the kicker. So a bourbon has to be aged in new charred American white oak barrels. Oh, so the th- oak. Yeah. So they... And it has to be new. It can't have been used for something else. And it has to be charred, which means that they essentially light the inside on fire. And that's what gives bourbon its very distinct taste. Hmm. Corn whiskey is not allowed to be put in new charred American white oak barrels. Because? Because because they want to maintain the the sanctity of bourbon. Um, It's this really big deal. The other thing is that bourbon has to be made in the United States. So that's why... Canadian whiskey can be made using all the same processes as a bourbon, but it's not a bourbon because it wasn't made in the U.S. Just like a scotch has to be made in Scotland. So they they really put these nice guardrails around trying to make bourbon a unique thing. Okay. And this doesn't meet the barrel requirement. It was aged in an American oak barrel, but it wasn't new or it wasn't charred, and that's how it doesn't get to be Mm. bourbon. So it's a corn whiskey. So close but no cigar close but no cigar and and sometimes that's intentional right sometimes places will not make it a bourbon because you can get bourbon that's made in wisconsin i think uh we had a rye but the same place that makes the rye makes bourbon so that is what we're tasting today the dancing goat eight year american corn whiskey um i'll open it up here we're gonna taste it so we got the glen cairn glasses for the past couple of times these are wee Glencairn glasses. Because they're little. Because they're littler. Yes. Anyway, I thought they were really cool, so I got a whole bunch of them. The other thing I got, Ooh. so uh, we've done ice cubes in the past. Yes. Um, that can modify the flavor profile a little bit. So instead, we have they have this fancy little water dropper. So this is pretty high proof. This one is a... Uh, 57.5%, so pretty high proof. So you will want to put a little bit of dropper of water in there. Um, the thing that's really cool about putting a dropper of water in there, I just learned this from one of my friends the other day. Uh, it proofs it down a little bit, so it's not quite as strong, which is a valuable thing. Uh, but also, there's a chemical reaction that happens between the water and some of the alcohol or some component in the whiskey that actually increases the viscosity of it. So it actually gives it a thicker mouth feel if you put a little dropper of water in it. Oh. Yeah, we'll just throw that down there. 
So anyway, I, I am going to put some water in mine, even though I don't mind the higher proof, because I have really enjoyed the increased viscosity. So, viscosity. Yes. I probably hear the bubble. These are teeny tiny glasses. Um, I'll, I will pour less. It's because this is not your guys' favorite thing. I want a bigger one. So we're coming off of the tasting of mead, which was Heidi's new favorite thing. Literally. So I apologize that you're probably going to be less happy about this. Um, yeah, so the way the dropper works is a little hole in the side. So, I mean, you can just let it out. Like, that's not very much water. You can just bloop. Bloop. There you go. And then give it a swirl to swirl it around, and you should see it. So remember when we talked about the legs? Um, that tells you essentially the viscosity on how it sticks to the glass. You should see it stick to the glass more when you put some water in it. Okay. I did my bloop. So, uh, and this time I prepared ahead. Yes. Be proud of me. I prepared ahead and that wasn't very much. I prepared ahead and I have the nose, the taste and the finish already written down here. So, so I'm not seeing the stickiness maybe it's just the lighting the glass is pretty small too so the legs are not quite as easy to see but mine is a little bit just a little just a little bit thicker yeah it's not a, a huge effect uh, or a hugely dramatic effect but, but all right shall we smell it yes let's okay. smell it okay apparently if you keep your mouth open while you sniff it gets you a better sniff they all smell the same to me. That's okay. I'm getting a... Like, they all have a lot of cinnamon and then alcohol. Cinnamon is in this one, yes. Well, I would have guessed that for all of them. So, I'll just read them off here. Like so a we... nutmeg? No? Uh, cloves. No. Cloves. That might be go. it. So, uh, maple syrup. Ah, that is what... Yes. Apple bake. Is there honey in this? There's not honey. Cinnamon, clove, ginger, cake batter, doughiness. The cake batter. Oh my gosh. Yeah, when you like smell vanilla cake, and it smells so good and you want to eat it. Does it does it make you want to taste it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, why don't we move into tasting then? And that's what the people keep coming back for. That is <laughs> not very good. It's so, <laughs> it's so much worse. Oh, I think it's so like I was like, yeah. man, we've done this a few times. Right, I can do we it. Can and do then it. it hit my mouth. Oh. And I was like, that one's bad. At first it was like, this is cake. And then it was like. No, uh -uh. no cake. Uh uh. Oh, that's not. It's just really strong. Holy crap. It is pretty high proof. So if you want to add a little bit more water to proof it down, that's okay. Can I put that glass into there? <laughs> no. You could add more water that way, but don't go that way. Okay. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. So to me, this does not taste like a bourbon because it's not. What do you mean? Uh, oh, it's a whiskey. It's a, a corn whiskey. I'm not actually, I'm I don't trying. know that I've had Sorry, corn whiskey. Um, okay. But the, the, the flavors that you should be getting here, <laughs> the flavors. Probably not getting them. Uh, this particular review that I found said that you should be getting almost a cola. So like think Coke. Okay, I'm getting that in the scent now. Okay. The Coke. Uh, it's a cola interplay of oak, sweet cream, ginger, apple crisp, and toffee. Like cream soda. Uh-huh. Oh, I like then, it doesn't taste I like, like but I like cream And then soda. there's a big baking spice component, which tells me that there's probably at least a little bit of rye in the Nashville. Oh, but the shivers. I told one of my friends that I was getting this, and he said that he had tried it and it wasn't his favorite. I have to disagree. So the the comparison that – so what I was drinking earlier in the first half of this episode was also Dancing Goat, but it was the six-year bourbon. And so I'm kind of like also mentally trying to compare the two. I like this better. Oh, 
I don't know if that means that I like corn whiskey better than I like bourbon. But anyway, and then, sorry, right, the last but bit. Corn whiskey, okay, there are distinctions, but it's similar to a bourbon. Yeah, the mash bill might be the same. The age statement might be the same. It just has to do with the barrels. Uh, sorry, the last piece. The last piece here is it's a long finish. It is a touch fiery because it's a high proof. Fiery. Uh, but it is complex fiery. and pleasant oak and ginger on the finish. Yeah, so, the ginger, I get that, like, clearing of the nose type feeling. Mm -hmm. Like wasabi. Not really, but kind oh. of. Mm. <laughs> well, thanks for putting up with this again. I know the Embers loved it, <laughs> even if you didn't. And I enjoyed this. Um, yeah, this is, this was quite good. So that was the Dancing Goat Eight Year American Corn Whiskey. Cheers, Cheers everybody. Cheers. All right, Embers, welcome back. Um, <laughs> that was an experience. It always is. Thanks, thanks, you guys for. Uh, for having some mortal spirits with me as opposed to the holy spirit right that's that's the point here is that it's not the holy spirit it's mortal spirits. Yes. anyway uh we were talking about dei mm -hmm. um and so the second half here uh, in the first half we we kind of went through what is dei what is diversity what is equity what is inclusion Sorry. and the corollaries associated with those things um so in the second part i just kind of like to to get some freeform discussion and and talk about a few different questions, not the least of which is what does scripture have to say about this? Because that's, we like to say that's the Ember Exchange component, right? We root all of our, our thoughts and our discussions in our Christian faith. And so we'll have certainly some study there to go through. But right off the bat, are there any uh, just freeform questions that you guys would like to, to address when we are thinking about this concept of DEI, whether it be in hiring or any other sort of thing? Um, I am curious if either of you think that there is any context in which DEI would be helpful or advantageous to society. Because there are certainly contexts where it is not. I think we kind of parse that out, but also we have to think about, like, in Alaska, the men who are driving the trucks in freezing weather trying to get our tuna. Like, if we had DEI in those spaces, then no one would ever have food. Like, there are certainly many, many occupations that it should be all men. And that's great. We should not try to implement DEI there. But, like, would you see any space for DEI? I would say that as it stands, no. None whatsoever. I would actually say because of the reason you just described, no. Okay. Because if we say that, oh, men, white men, we trust them to be the doing the dirty jobs and the critical jobs, um, but we're going to favor others over them when it comes to other jobs, that just seems it, the opposite of fair. Right. Right? And so, yeah, you, you rely on this particular demographic to be – essentially in charge of keeping critical functions running. But mm -hmm. when it comes to other opportunities, you're like, ah, actually, we don't need you. And actually, we'd prefer not you. And that that is inherently unfair. It comes from just the philosophical idea for me that what you look like or what you self-identify as, which is such a big thing now. Or who should you're have, sleeping with. Or who you're sleeping with should have no bearing whatsoever on whether you get a job. You should be able to perform the job better than the other people. Because that's that also is like the purpose of hiring an employee, right? You're hiring somebody to do a job. And so the goal is to hire the best person to do the job. If by some circumstance you happen to have a job that requires a black woman and somehow that makes her more qualified to do the job, Sure, but then that's not DEI anymore, right? You're hiring, it's a meritocracy, and the merit is based on, I, I can't even think of a job where that particular qualification of what 
you have between your legs and what you look like makes you more qualified for the job. I but. I feel like qualifications aside, there might be adv- advantages of like a man or a woman in the space. Like we already talked about men doing the dirty jobs, but like, I don't know. I haven't had kids yet, but like I would prefer that my OBGYN or my midwife be a female. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or like even in the financial planning world, they're itching for female financial planners because sometimes women – prefer to speak to other women about vulnerable things like finances and like your relationship with your financial planner is important and so if like I relate better to a woman sitting across this table than a man then like it would be advantageous for my company to have a female financial planner on their team to attract those types of people so is she being hired because she's a woman or because she's better for the job well both being a woman might make her qualifications equal I might choose the female because I know that she might relate better with my clientele but one of the qualifications is relating with female clientele so that's a qualification so she fits so she fits the qualification better than your male counterpart or sure candidate hence she's being hired based on the merit it would be important to also know that she is as qualified. Right. In general, men are designed, to, I mean, this goes back to our conversation, yeah, men are does. designed to work. Women are designed to be homekeepers and child bearers and rearers. And, and it's a bell curve, right? Right. Um, there, may, there are definitely women who are more qualified than men at some things, but the mean of the bell curve is that men are more qualified, generally speaking, to work jobs and less qualified to raise children. Which, now now this is an aspect where, again, this it still goes back to merit, but you think about a preschool teacher or a kindergarten teacher. Some of our friends, right, are teachers, mm-hmm. and they listen to this podcast. Thanks, you guys. They are more qualified to be teachers of young children because they have the maternal instincts. Mm-hmm. And that's an enormous component of that job is knowing how to relate well to children. Right. And so that's, but you wouldn't hire them based on having to meet some quota of females. You would say you are inherently designed better to be at this job. That's meritocracy all the way down. Right. I think a lot of, at least what I'm talking about is just like the natural way that things work. If you want a female, you're going to hire the female because she's going to relate better with your clients. Like that isn't forced on you by the government. Or it shouldn't be. No. I think it should be a wise decision of a business owner to say, how am I going to hire my employees? But you're not doing it that – so you're the employer in this hypothetical. Yeah. You're not doing it because you want to hire a woman. Well, you're doing it because you want to hire the best person to serve your clients, and that happens to be a woman. Sure. Because that's the point of a job, right? It, right. Jo- businesses are not charities, or they shouldn't be. Right, You want to make your business the best it can be, not just for you as the business owner, but for your customers. Mm-hmm. Right, And so the people who are coming to you for financial planning advice, they want the best financial planning advice that they can get. Mm-hmm. And so they are trusting you as the owner of this business to hire the best financial planners you can find. And I think that many clientele like come assuming that the employer has hired the best person for the job. Mm-hmm. Traditionally, yes. So though I think is pretty vulnerable when it comes yeah. to mm-hmm. many spaces. And that's why, I mean, so by the time of people listening to this, maybe it'll still be a thing. When we're recording this, we're just coming off of a big hubbub about DEI and airlines. And so there's a lot of trust that comes when you get on a plane. And there have been... Some recent documented cases where that trust was ill-founded and the door of the plane flew off mid-flight. Now, whether that is directly attributable to DEI, I think is a little bit harder to prove. But if you go to the the websites of those airlines, they've been pushing this sort of DEI hiring practices for a while now. And so it makes you think, is this... (laughs) Is that that trust that comes into this relationship, whether it be financial planning or even getting on an airplane, do people need to start rethinking that because of these? You would hope that that's not the case, but people are going to start doing that naturally. Right. I mean, correlation is not causation with the whole airline thing, but it does make you think 
twice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's why I would say you can't you can't prove that that's why. But every one of those airlines that had something happen there, you go and they're all pulling their DEI pages down because they don't want that linked, right? Because it, it could right. be, it very well could be. I don't want somebody, right? We talked about disability um, being one of the components here. I don't want somebody with one arm assembling my airplane. I'm sorry. Like you might be a wonderful person, but if you having one arm means that you're not as able to tighten those bolts as well as the guy with two arms, I don't want you assembling my plane. Right. And I get anxious on flights. And so I should not be a pilot <laughs> just because I am a female and like could, I could in my brain, like do it. I'm smart enough to be a pilot. They could say you're going to be a pilot because you're a female. That's a bad idea. Well, and anxiety is clinical. Right. Well, I don't have point. clinical anxiety, but, but, but like you could, right? And they would you would have to be hired then or you would be higher on the list to be hired if you had clinical anxiety because that's a disability and they have to fill a quota. Yeah. Do you right. really want your pilot? No. To have Mid anxiety? Flight? No. No, you Why do not would you want hire me to based on that. That's ridiculous. Right. But also should they even be applying? We oh, so do. you can't right 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 right. Because you, Jill, you dealt with this a little bit in your job, right? Like, for someone, I've dealt had... with it in a few various ways. Yeah. Okay. Tell us about that. So, the one being a fellow colleague that at the time was given alternative goals to hit versus the rest of the team. Mm -hmm. Now it was a role where we had like service tickets and calls to answer. In an average day, let's say, I would answer and do 100 tickets and 25 phone calls. Because my colleague brought a doctor's note to prove clinical anxiety, those numbers were reduced to two calls a day and 10 tickets. So that's one-tenth of the email service tickets and approximately a tenth of the calls. And I think something that also comes up in DEI where this is not, it's just not a genuine approach to actually, if you believe there's inequality or diversity should be a thing, it's not a genuine way to approach it. Because let me tell you, as her colleague and the other colleagues I had, we didn't feel bad or feel like she should be included mm. when all of a sudden, there were 23 calls she wasn't taking and 90 other tickets. We still had to get them done. And like most places, a lot of companies have like a number of employees that they budget for in a year or budget for, you know, at any given time. Yeah. Well, she counted as one of those people in that role. So it wasn't like we got to hire an extra person. Right. And so you guys weren't feeling particularly we, enthralled by the fact no. that you couldn't fire her because, and that was an right. ADA case. The ADA came in and, and said, then, yeah, and then the ADA got her. involved. So it's like, no, mm. we were not feeling, we were not feeling inclusive. And it's one of those situations where, in that case, like equity, well, someone gets raised up, as in she got raised up because her goals got brought down. That meant that she was now meeting the standard, like all of us were meeting the standard. However, we... Because the standard was different. You, right. The standard was different. But then we all got dr drugged down by that because it literally meant we just had more work on our plate that oftentimes wasn't able, like was physically not capable of getting done in the hours in a day. Mm. Yeah. No, it makes sense. It's just... It's hard to understand why an employer would even want to have these DEI protocols because shouldn't they want to kindly let go of the person with anxiety? They can't, though. That's the problem. The ADA does not let you. Right. And so that's where the government enforcement is a problem because even right. if a company says, this is I, I, this person is doing no work and I'm paying them, I should be able to fire them. The ADA comes in and says, uh-uh-uh. They have diagnosed anxiety so you can't fire them that's covered by our disability clause and so. it's like my heart goes out to that person who is unable to do the job it's like there has to be a space for those people right and there can be accommodations made for people who have 
disabilities and maybe some anxiety to an extent, but it can't affect the other employees or the company. Like I'm going to I'm going to break your perspective a little bit more too. Yeah. The clini- clinicization of things like anxiety and depression mean that this person maybe didn't even have that, but because they wanted to be paid to not do work, they can just say, "I have an anxiety." But you so, have to have a doctor's note, but doctors are you handing can go to out any, exactly. pills I could, and candy. I could get anxiety as a prescribed thing if I wanted to. Oh my gosh, look at I so easily. And then yeah. what? I just have to do half the work. Exactly. But here's the th- And so there are, there are, you wouldn't do that, there but are there are people terrible people out there, out there who do. Would do that. It, but it's Which not is good really... for the person either. Like their mental health, talk about mental health. Like to be in a job that you're just like not great at and your employers resent you for being there. But they don't care. They're like, whatever, I'm getting a paycheck. People are strange. And similarly, that makes it very difficult for those that maybe do in fact Mm -hmm. need those accommodations. Because that, I I do think to an extent, right? Because as in a different role, as a person that now does hire people on my team, I also had an employee do that to me. So the ADA was called in on that. And, and it was in that case, it was very clearly an excuse for incompetence. Like the correct the, the employee like, was incompetent, but the they role didn't want to was get not fired. Being, so like the uh, role uh, uh. wasn't being accomplished for some time, and then once approached, the ADA got pulled into it due to anxiety. I don't really want to deal with it anymore because mm. of the people that take advantage of that system. Yeah, you're. I don't. I don't you're pre- I, Prejudice also is a ruined word. You're prejudiced against somebody who might legitimately need help because you've had several encounters with people who have taken advantage of the system. Yeah. It's again, this like 20% of people are ruining it for 80% of other people. I think those percentages are flipped around though. I think it's 80% ruin it for the 20. The majority really? of cases, yeah, the majority of cases are people taking advantage of the system. Ignorance is bliss. Yeah. And so, so really, again, it's just the DEI program, the whatever government program that they want to put in place that becomes essentially their next industry. What corporations will be our consumer to just eat all of this up and implement what we want to essentially create a more divisive workplace in the end? Because like I said, when I was an employee and those things were happening, was not happy to be the employee sitting next to the person that I knew was getting this. Right. Wasn't happy as the employer with an employee that was getting away with this. So it doesn't sound like DEI is an advantage for the employer or the employee who is unable to do the job because of their physical limitations. I guess race and like sexual orientation and all of that maybe wouldn't have as much of an impact on their ability to do the job. But either way, there's a mental component to it that is sort of degrading. It's like, oh, I only got this job because I'm black or gay. And like that. People are okay with that, though, is the problem. Like, But that's degrading. Specifically, though, I am not okay with it. Yeah. And I'm an Asian woman. Yeah, you are. I would much rather know that I am at the job I'm in because they thought I was going to do a good job. Mm-hmm. But you, because of these policies, you have no idea. But you I might have, have been no hired idea because you're an Asian woman. I could equivalently get the hire because they were like, "Well, well, that'll check that box. Great, let's hire her on." And I have no idea. I also have no idea if everybody in my company that knows DEI is a thing, because most companies that make DEI a thing are pretty vocal about being like, hey, we are DEI and we do these things, right? It is. It's a point of pride for them. So what if I do have other colleagues that have had negative experiences about this? And now they may not like that I got in a role or I got some internal promotion because, well... I, oh, she only got I that applied, because she's I applied Asian. for that too, but she's an Asian woman. Right. Well, I want that because I know I earned it based on what I can do and the job I can do for my employer. And I would feel, I do feel a lot better if I know that it is based on my merit, not based on what I look like. Right. And But I would venture to say that 
a lot of people feel the same way that you do. I think you'd be surprised. I probably would be, but the people that I hang around, which probably is not the people who are not going to feel. You hang this around way. us, Heidi. <laughs> but like, <laughs> I don't know. I okay. Yeah. So I had a little from Big Brothers Big Sisters, who is black, right? And so she was young and in school, like middle school, when I was her big, and she would express a lot of the same things. Where it's like, oh, well, I probably just got that because I was black. Or like, oh, I probably just got that because I'm black and, like, my mom is poor or I don't have a dad in that. Which is heartbreaking. Which is Wouldn't demoralizing you for her. You would rather her. her know that she got the job because she was qualified Exactly. For and she's she's young. So I'm saying that, like, yeah, there are some adults that want to take advantage of the system and maybe some kids too. But, like, raising children in this mindset of, like, oh, I'm different or I'm not white and so therefore I – may or may not deserve to be here is a super unstable space and context to like look at your lens through. So for the sake of this individual that you you describe, in her situation, if if these sorts of programs were not a thing, she would feel way better about herself. Her self-confidence would be higher. Absolutely. So that's a humongous point against DEI. Right, that's what I'm saying. Is like it, it doesn't seem like it's advantageous for there to be government implied rules and regulations around this. Yeah, or even employer advocated things. Right, if the employer says I want, and this happened, so this was a part of the whole. Uh, if if the embers are really interested, I'm not going to go into great detail, but um, there was a large kerfuffle with Mark Cuban, the investor, Shark Tank owner of the the Dallas Mavericks, where he was trying to argue very strongly for DEI, and he was just getting blasted all over Twitter um, for that. And it ended up with him just pouting, more or less, is how I would describe it, because <laughs> he, got, he got real beat up over it. But um, even for an employer to say, you know, I'm really big on DEI, that's that gives the same impression to like this individual that you describe. Well, did I get just hired because I was black and the employer really wants to hire a bunch of black people that's that's terrible you that's if you say one. i hire people because they're the best for the job and i choose you that makes them feel so much better about themselves yeah and and encourages them to work harder and be better people and if that's you you're you're going to be much more motivated to be a a contributing member of society if you know that you were hired because the person looked at you and said, yes, I want that person on my team. Mm -hmm. Not because of what you look like, but because of what you can do for them. Right. That's, that's valuable. So, um, related to the, the, the concept of causing divisiveness within teams, I have a whole bunch of studies here. I'm not going to go through each of them. Um, but a number of studies showed that uh, including DEI training as a required component for their employees actually caused more divisiveness and less inclusivity than not having it because it was essentially forced down. If you're a white employee, it's getting shoved down your throat. And so you're much more aware and much less disposed to be nice to people who, are, who don't look like you because you've been told that, oh, you suck because you're a white person. And personally, I, again, as an Asian woman, yeah, Outside of my literal face being Asian, I don't need an extra reminder. I don't need a reminder also that maybe you only hired me for that. My friends don't remind me that I'm Asian all the time or that I look different. At least none of the friends that I've kept. Not that I've, I don't think I've ever had any friends that have made that a point. Mm-hmm. Right, but most of them are more uncomfortable when you make j- Asian jokes than they just Correct. are like, "Can I laugh?" Because she's right, Asian. is that okay? <laughs> That's funny, guys. <laughs> but like, truly, right, and, and even to the point, and it it's sort of humorous. But when I was younger, my mom would sometimes, in a very awkward mom fashion, ask my friends like, "Oh, do you see Jill as different because she's Asian?" And they were always kind of like what? No. Like, but those are the kind of friends I want to have. Those are the kind of employers I want to have. Those are ki- the kind of people I want to be around. It's not because of m- Not because the type of people who are like, oh yes, we just love that Jill brings an intersectional personality to our company Ew, culture. Actually, that's so gross. Okay. <laughs> so gross, yeah. right? Like, what else do I bring to your company? Hopefully the fact that I'm a qualified individual and I can do the job well, but nah. Yeah. Who cares about that, right? 
I don't know the the words they use, but being race blind. Colorblind. Colorblind. Are you in favor of that? Where you just look at another individual as a human being and don't see them through the context of their race? Yes. Why wouldn't I be? Well, it's a great question. I think it makes a lot of sense to treat people with equality and say, okay, you're a human being. I'm a human being. I'm going to treat you as that regardless of your race, not give you more advantages or less advantages. But a lot of people would say, no, you need to look at me as a black woman because that's something that I am proud of and like I have culture behind me and it means a lot to who I am and has made me who I am. And so therefore you have to acknowledge that when you're like speaking to me and hiring me, which doesn't make any sense. Or I identify as a woman and so you must use my pronouns. Zer. Which is not male or female, but okay. You bigot. Okay. <laughs> Why? For I'm, real though. I'm a demi boy. Yeah, okay. I'm not hiring you. But can't you like <laughs> 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 For real though. Also, isn't it sort of obvious? Okay, but that's so stereotyping. Go I'm ahead. going to sue you because you said you weren't hiring me because of that. Yeah, well, I'm just not gonna. I'm not gonna tell you that in the interview. But you're not getting the job. It doesn't matter. I didn't get the job, so I'm gonna sue you anyway. You can. Can people just really sue because I didn't get a job? Yes. Yeah. Gosh, people need. There's life. a whole entire section in the like Wisconsin law that is unright or unjust not hiring and trying to f- figure out if you were unjustly like not chosen for a job because of one of these things. Okay, so. The last component of this kind of freeform discussion is we should really bring it back to scripture. Yes. And I think this is a really great place to kind of wrap the conversation. So what does mm-hmm. scripture have to say about these things? We are truth forward. We're also Christ centered. So this is going to be where we derive a lot of our ideas from. Um, so it's good in this context if we can, yeah, try to see what scripture has to say about this. So I have a few written mm-hmm. down. Yeah. Um, As do yeah. I. As do I. And I just want to say that Jesus is loving and he is kind. And he also caused a lot of rifts in society Mm -hmm. and uh, was literally crucified for causing those rifts in the the cultural context of the time. And so as nervous as I was to do this topic, I think it is important especially this part of it to like dive deep into what does the bible really say yeah. we can have our own thoughts and opinions but at the end of the day truth is truth and so even if it's going to cause some rifts in society i think it's still important to to talk about absolutely being unafraid to speak the truth in love mm-hmm. but unafraid to speak the truth is one of the hallmarks of mm-hmm. christ himself and also those of us who try to be like him right And I think a lot of these scriptures that we are going to take, I mean, we could flesh each of them out individually and it could take two hours. So Uh, Mm -hmm. we're just going to admittedly possibly take them out of context, but take them for what it's worth and do your own digging um, and come to your own conclusions based on scripture. But these are some Mm -hmm. of the things that we found. Yep. Yeah. I think there's a few that have a similar theme here. So in the New Testament, you find this idea, uh, this, a lot of these relate specifically to salvation, right? Mm -hmm. Which is admittedly different than DEI. Um, But DEI didn't exist when the New Testament or the Old Testament was written. So there's not like, and thou shalt not hire the lesbian who is among you, right? Right. The Bible doesn't say that. It doesn't say that specifically. Mm -hmm. So we have to try to infer from what is here. Mm -hmm. And and so what I see as kind of a theme um, in a couple of different places, actually, I have four references. So Galatians 3.28, Colossians 3.11, Romans 10.12, and 1 Corinthians 12.12 12 and 13 is all this concept of there being no distinction between Jew and Greek or Jew and Gentile in Christ. doesn't matter your uh, ethnic background, all stand before Christ as sinners and are in need of salvation and have equivalent access to salvation in Christ. Mm-hmm. And so that, that paints this picture for me that, to use the term, uh, salvation is colorblind. It doesn't matter what you look like, particularly with respect to race. Um, 
Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what you look like or where you came from, you're equivalently accessible for salvation. That doesn't apply necessarily to some of the other categories that fall under DEI. If you are choosing to live in sin unrepentantly, unregenerately, that's a different thing. But specifically when it comes to the question of race, there is no Jew or Greek, no Jew or Gentile. All are the same in Christ Jesus. I went towards the route of kind of the employee-employer because DEI obviously encapsulates a lot of that or is involved in a lot of that. And I came out with a couple of things. So the first being that we were kind of talking about how DEI brings up this victimhood mentality. Like, I've been so wronged or I came from such a low place and so I deserve, you know, more or better. And there are many places both in the New Testament and the Old Testament that call out quite the opposite. And in a lot of the scenarios, they are, it's the Lord speaking to warriors and the people that are escaping Egypt or speaking to Joshua. But in all of them, Joshua 1, 9 specifically, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And then in Deuteronomy, be strong and courageous, do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Both of those pointing nothing towards being a victim, nothing towards this woe is me. Mm. Again, in the eyes of God, we are all pitiful, but regardless... He's going to be with us, and we need to have courage and strength in that. Mm -hmm. And wherever we start from and wherever we're going, we should take advantage of our opportunities, which kind of points me towards my last one, and that is Colossians 3.23, and that's whatever you do, work hardly as for the Lord and not for men. So you should work hard for what you earn. Mm -hmm. You should want to get the job based on merit because we as Christians at least are not working for the men, for the people that are calling out DEI or giving away free roles because I'm an Asian woman, mm -hmm. but because I can be proud of what I am doing if I'm doing it for the Lord and giving it my all all the time because God asks that of me. Yeah. In my opinion, DEI should be less of something that's implemented and more a way that we live our lives. I want to have equality with other people in the sense that we are both children of the Lord and I want to include my neighbor even though they look different than me. And like our hearts and lives can be changed by Jesus regardless of our race, our ethnicity, our gender, even our sexual orientation or disabilities that we have. Like the Lord is powerful enough to redeem all of that when we walk in obedience with him. You know, and as far as diversity goes, like God does not see diversity of sin. All sin separates us from him. Equity, all of us are equal at the cross, every single one of us. And inclusion, the Bible is completely the opposite of the world. It is not fair. It is not fair that anyone gets to have eternal life. But it is the reality and it is the way that God, who is perfect, operates. And so actually, I, I think that God is very much against DEI. So in Philippians 2, he says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who, having been in very nature with God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every single tongue, it doesn't matter. Oh, another thing that I was going to say is that, like, the God of the Old Testament is clearly the same, is the was... the same as the God of the New Testament. Same yeah, guy. Yeah, and he literally destroyed entire people groups because they were practicing the very things that we are trying to introduce and encourage in our yeah. society. So 
let me tell you that the same God in the Old Testament is the same God today, and um, he's not about diversity and equity and inclusion when it comes to, well, when it comes to, like, gender and sexuality and, like, no, there's no DI. You just flat out are dead. So in conclusion, that is the God that we serve, and he seems to be pretty against DEI. But then when we bring Jesus down, like he acknowledged the female, the woman at the well, which was very countercultural, and he healed the person with a disability, and he healed the lepers who were literally outcasts from society, and he invited tax collectors who people hated into his community, and he hired fishermen as his apprentices, like, he did things that were countercultural in a positive light, but it wasn't coming from the government. It was coming from his heart of love. So that's kind of where I think the Bible lands on that, but it's much deeper than that, I'm sure. Yeah. And I think that's a, a, a good place to end there. So thank you. Well, thank you, Ember, so much for joining us. I think that proved to be as spicy as I thought it was going to be. Um, so thank you both for engaging this hot topic, a challenging topic, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of baggage that comes with it, a lot of emotion that gets tied up into it. And I think you, the Embers got to see a little bit of that from us, but hopefully we were also able to speak the truth in love, which is, you know, important. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of one of Jesus' things that we're supposed to do. So thank you, Embers, for listening. And engaging with this podcast, it means a lot to us. Mm -hmm. It does. And if you're hearing this or watching this, you've probably found us at least on one platform, but we are on many. We are on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. We're on YouTube. You can find our link just on Buzzsprout if you listen to your podcast somewhere else. We're probably there. Wherever you decide to engage, feel free. Please drop us a like, give us a review, leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you and share this with your friends. We are just starting out. We are starting from scratch in our basement, but it is the only way for this fire to grow. So please help us spread it. Yeah, and also we love if you would engage with us on Instagram and X and especially X. Especially X. I've discovered X. Please come and engage with me. I like the controversial conversations. <laughs> I'm learning how to argue on social media and it's a blast. If you go to at Ember Exchange, that links to each of our, our pages. Yeah. So yes. go to at Ember Exchange on X on Instagram on all the places and you'll find us. All right. Well, burn bright embers. Hope you have a great day.